So we're now going to move to the matter of public importance. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 27 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Pratt. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Morrison government's desire to make it easier for employers to cut workers' pay and conditions. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly, and I call Senator Sheldon. Oh, is the motion supported? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, so I'll ask the clerks to reset the clocks, and I'll call Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, you know, let's look at what's been happening with wages in this country. Pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. Now, pre-pandemic, we've had wage stagnation under this government. Eight years of this government in power, and we're seeing year after year of wage stagnation. Of course, now post-COVID, it's very clear whether you look at reports from economists, the Reserve Bank, that we're also facing not only wage stagnation but wage decline. So under eight years, wages stagnate. Over the coming years, wages decline. But don't worry, not everyone's wages have been suppressed. Because in reports today, Billionaires in the last 12 months' incomes have gone up by 56 per cent. So everybody else out there, your wages have declined, but under this government's watch, billionaires are making more and more and more money. I actually don't begrudge them that. What I begrudge is the fact that the government doesn't understand how trickle-down doesn't work. You actually have to give workers, working people, people in the communities, small business that negotiates with those billionaires, quite large business that negotiates with those billionaires, you have to give them power to actually get a share of the wealth, not leave it into that small clique which they support. The system that they support and they've generated is to say that billionaires are OK and the rest of us aren't. And of course, then you go to what the government's doing in the latest drive for a pay cut, scrutiny of enterprise agreements. Well, let's get rid of that. Let's make sure that enterprise agreements that don't meet standards. Let's make sure that the Commission is rushed and required to enter and look at and review agreements before they have an appropriate time to properly review, because that's what they've proposed. But they've actually gone a step further. They've said that appropriate parties, and such as unions, can't make applications to appropriately, as previously been done, to criticise or highlight those dodgy deals. Now, what happens with those dodgy deals when they go through? Not only are workers abused, but also it destabilises markets. It means that those companies who are doing the right thing are destabilised by the people who are getting away with theft. That's legalised theft. They've done nothing effective about wage theft, and the latest proposals are a small uh, shadow of what's needed. But what they want to do is actually legalise it. And they want to put bad employees in the front seat and put good employees down on the ground. They want to make sure that there is a disproportionate and destabilising effect in the labour market. Because what are they about? Wage decline. Wage decline year after year, and their record proves it. And of course, now they want to also have, you know, they wanted to have non-monetary benefits. Now they want to expand the non-monetary benefits, which were originally put in acts so that people had protections of the Industrial Relations Commission for benefits they received in negotiated agreements and elsewhere. It wasn't below the NES. But what they propose is now that McDonald's application that rather than paying you wage increases, you can have wage cuts based on getting a packet of chips, fries, 
You know what's the saying? You know what do they say when you go into McDonald's? In this case, here's your pay cuts, and do you want fries with that? Well, this government's now making it legal for the company store to operate. That was something that was thrown out in the early 1900s in this country and progressively abolished effectively throughout the 1900s, even further. But this government wants to go back to it. They want to go back to it because they just can't help themselves. They have to say, here's about a pandemic, here's a crisis, and who do we really need to do over? Those people have the chance, the opportunity, the desire to express their voice collectively. And of course, I'll have to finish on the gig economy. Bajal Paul, four others that were killed as a result of being in the gig economy. Tens of thousands of people in the gig economy. And what does this government do? No regulations to support them, to protect them or give them rights. In actual fact, if you look at the number of their people on the cross bench, on the, on the back bench, they're fairly supporting you, those people being you, exploited. Senator. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. We've just heard another divisive old class war warrior rhetoric contribution, rhetorical contribution to the Senate. Let's all remember that the workplace relations framework in this country is under the Fair Work Act, heralded by the Australian Labor Party, introduced by the Australian Labor Party. And so that independent umpire that sets wages and conditions is now being slagged off by the Australian Labor Party, the very creator of the system. Now, to my friends opposite, you can't have it both ways. You cannot say that we have championed the cause of workers and brought to you the fair work regime and, on the other hand, somehow condemn the government for the decisions that are allowed to go through the Fair Work Commission. Now, look, a fair day's pay for a day, fair day's work is a biblical injunction which is embedded at the very heart of coalition policy in this area. No Liberal, no National wants to see workers' pay cut. Instead, what we seek to do is pursue policies to not only grow jobs but also wages. And that is why, after a decade of the Howard government, we saw unemployment with a three in front of it, unheard of for a long, long time and since, and might I add, real wages growing without impacting on inflation. That is what good sound economic management delivers. And why do we pursue good sound economic management? Because of the social dividend that it delivers for the men and women of Australia. So, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President, it takes the economic illiteracy of the Labor Party to have ripped apart those credentials that the Howard government left. And here we are today grappling with a global pandemic seeking to restore the Australian economy, Australian jobs and Australian opportunities. And we've got the shamelessness of Labor. And indeed, Senator Sheldon reminded us of dodgy deals. And it triggered something in my mind. Who actually sought enterprise agreements to see workers in the mushroom sector worse off? Workers in the cleaning sector worse off? Workers in the building sector worse off? None other than the now Member of Parliament, but former Secretary of the Australian Workers' Union, Mr Bill Shorten. Let's be very, very clear. Three areas where workers were underpaid in circumstances where the agreement was signed off by the Australian Workers' Union whilst Mr Shorten was in control. And let's be very clear. There are certain allegations that in relation to those deals there were quid pro quos which allowed certain benefits to flow to the member for Maribyrnong. That remains to be seen. But let's be very clear. Why are the Labor Party bringing this up today? 
and do it from time to time to try to create a smokescreen to distract attention from their real policy, which is to abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission and the Registered Organisations Commission. And why are they so manic about it? Because the Registered Organisations Commission has an active investigation going on as we speak into the activities of the Australian Workers' Union, while Mr Shorten was the secretary of it. The Australian Workers' Union documents that have now been filed indicate over $1 million worth of Australian Workers' Union funds have been expended in fruitless and vexatious litigation against the Registered Organisations Commission. These people opposite that cry crocodile tears for workers have no compunction about signing up deals that rips off workers and then rip off their union funds as well. And so why is it that the Australian Workers' Union is so, spending so much money in protecting Mr Shorten? Because the Australian Workers' Union haven't done that to another secretary of the Australian Workers' Union, namely one Caesar Mellon, who is in the Victorian Parliament. And that issue has seen a $148,000 fine being imposed on the Australian Workers' Union. Of what do I speak? The falsely enrolling of various bogus members without their knowledge or consent, including workers of companies with whom the AWU had enterprise agreements, and most creatively, jockeys who were members of the Australian Jockeys Association and netballers who were members of the Australian Netballers Association. And when these allegations came to the fore, what did the Australian Workers' Union do? They raised the white flag. They did not seek to defend. They did not seek to take this matter to court. It begs the question why, given what they did in relation to Mr Shorten. And I suppose it begs this question. If it had gone to court, if it had gone to trial, Mr Mellon may have been asked a question such as, how long had these rorts been going on? And whose idea was it in the first place? In the case of the netballers and jockeys rort, the answer to these questions seemed quite clear. It was on 13 February 2005, the Australian Workers' Union issued a media release entitled Netball stars joined the AWU, which included the following boast. The AWU's experience in representing other elite sports people, such as horse racing jockeys, will help us to better represent the interests of some of the most talented women in Australian sport. Do you know who made that boast? None other than the current member for Maribyrnong. There he was on the public record boasting about these rorted numbers being introduced into the Australian Workers' Union, which in turn, of course, had the impact of being able to impact Labor Party votes and Labor Party pre-selections. So there are a number of issues. Right, Senator, uh, you're raising a point of order. It's a robust chamber. is sounding very close to the wind in the way that he is talking about the member from Maribyrnong, and I'd ask him to uh, cease reflecting on a member from the other place. Um, on the point of order, I will remind you, uh, Senator uh, Abetz, to uh, be mindful of the way that we speak about people in that other chamber, and I invite you to continue your remarks. I can understand the sensitivity of those opposite to the facts that I have laid out exceptionally carefully. There is no doubt that Mr Mellon and the Australian Workers' Union provided to the court an agreed statement of facts agreeing that the figures that they had presented were rorted. They were falsified. People's names had been put on the record without their knowledge, courtesy of the enterprise agreements and cooperation from their employers. And the boast that I just read out, which seems to have excited 
the um, interjection was on the public record on the 13th of February 2005, which can be easily shown uh, to be correct. So I understand the sensitivity of the Australian Labor Party, and when these matters, these dodgy deals, these matters are fully highlighted, one gets to see what really motivates the Australian Labor Party in this. Is there any Australian who genuinely believes that anybody in this place would want to see Australian workers paid less? Of course there isn't. Each and every one of us is dedicated, one would hope, to the service of the Australian people and wanting the very best for them. We know on this side, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the opportunity of employment enhances somebody's self-esteem, their social interaction, their physical health, their mental health. The social good of employment is there for all to be seen. And that is why it's so important that any policy initiative is designed to ensure that more of our fellow Australians can get onto the ladder of opportunity, which is employment, the capacity to be self-reliant, the self-esteem of knowing that you can look after yourself and your fellow family members of the same household. These are the good things that come out of employment. That is why we, on this side, we as a government, so unrelentingly pursue not only every single employment opportunity but also good wages and outcomes, always as determined by the independent umpire who is the Fair Work Commission, established by none other than the Australian Labor Party. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This government is full of the ideological children of John Howard. A fundamental project of the Liberal and National parties is shifting the balance of power from workers to capital. At every turn, they will privilege profits of corporations, of billionaires and rent seekers over the well-being of people and communities. Their policy agenda is the result of laziness, malice and an irrational obsession with free markets and competition. Decades of market-led policy, labour market deregulation and union busting have diminished the quality of work for so many people. It has turbocharged inequality and worsened the degradation of our environment. This government's version of common sense is that what's good for big business is good for the community. They have no real abiding belief in the value of meaningful work, social labour or care. No real commitment to the rights of workers to be safe, to be happy and respected at work, to be able to work and play and flourish. The only kind of flexibility that this government is interested in is supporting the flexibility of employers to hire and fire workers. Inevitably, favouring flexibility for businesses will mean precarity and powerlessness for workers. COVID-19 has shown us just how dangerous precarious employment can be for workers and for society. That the government is trying to use this crisis to further undermine workplace rights, workers' pay and conditions in favour of businesses is cynical, it's despicable and is, it is staggeringly irresponsible. They've been wanting to do this for a long, long time. With regards to the anti-worker IR omnibus bill, just removing the appalling measure to suspend the boot won't cut it. The bill will still remain appalling. It will still make it harder for most casuals to convert to permanent work. It still effectively casualizes part-time workers without any increases in entitlements. It still locks workers and unions out of enterprise bargaining. It needs to be scrapped. Maybe workers' wages and conditions are abstract concepts to this government. Maybe they are so out of touch with working people that they don't actually know how precarity and poverty feel. I've lost count of the numbers, number of times I have sat right here in this chamber and watched members of the government giggle and gossip as they vote to plunge people into poverty, take away their rights and dignity and entrench and worsen inequalities. Workers deserve so much more than the cold, callous disregard of the Liberals and Nationals. Senator Polly. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Everything that this Liberal government does and has done since I came to office in 2013 is to weaken unions and 
drive wages down. That's the reality of it. No matter what other senators from that side come into this chamber and say, that's exactly what they do. When they took away penalty rates to people in hospitality and retail and they promised they'd create job after job after job, how many jobs were created? None. None at all. That is actually driving down wages. Don't come into this chamber and try and rewrite history. We know that it's in your DNA. You want to weaken unions. You don't want workers to have representation. And you have no interest in ensuring that wages growth will increase. We have seen stagnant wages year after year under your watch while you're in government. And we know that there's some 13 million Australians that rely on good government and good working conditions. What we also know in this country is the attack that you are now applying and trying to get through this place will only disadvantage some of the lowest paid workers in this country. If you look at aged care, we know there are some of the most underpaid employees in this country. They don't have the respect that they deserve working to look after the most vulnerable people in this community. And we know with these changes, they will lose $12,000 per year, an aged care worker. That's what your agenda is. That is so wrong. And we on this side will year after year, day after day, week after week, we will defend workers' rights and we will do everything that we can to ensure that their pay and conditions are preserved. We don't want to see uh, penalty rates taken away. We don't want to see changes to part-time workers because if you do not have a full-time job or a job that has legitimacy so that you can go and apply for a bank loan, you're not helping the economy. You are stifling people's opportunities to buy their own home. The day-to-day the -day stress that is placed on so many workers in this country with the casualisation and the underemployment in this country is abuse of these workers. That's not doing anything um, to actually uh, build our economy. If you want to come out of this pandemic from uh, COVID-19 and you want to uh, rebuild the economy, you want to get people back working, well, that's not the way to go about it. It's certainly not the way to go about it. But what we've seen time and time again is an attack on the most vulnerable workers. We know many of those, whether you're talking about hospitality, whether you're talking about uh, retail, whether you're talking about aged care, disability, the majority of those workers are women. So again, you're hitting women again and again and again. You don't want to increase the superannuation um, for Australian workers. You don't want to do that. And once again, who are those in our community that are going to be hardest hit? A, you want to change and lower the wages for those sectors that I've outlined already, which means women again are going to be the most disadvantaged uh, not only in their take-home pay and the amount of hours that they're going to have to work, but just as importantly, you're attacking superannuation. And we know already women in this country don't have, the majority of them do not have enough money to retire on. That's your legacy. That's the Liberals' legacy. That's the DNA of the Liberal government, the Liberal coalition. That's what they are about. Now, if you want to build a strong economy, you want to build uh, a strong, highly skilled workforce, then you need to not attack workers and try and take money away from them. You should be investing in TAFE, for instance, investing so we can skill up Australian workers, so people can go and retrain when there's changes in their work um, environment. But what we see time and time again is rhetoric by those opposite coming in here and they want to drag up and they want to vilify unions when, in fact, every Australian worker needs to be a member of a union and there's no more important time than right now because you need their protection. Thank you, Senator Polly. Call Senator Small. 
Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm glad Senator Polly raises the DNA of the Morrison government, because in our DNA is jobs and more of them for all Australians. Our track record speaks to that, with 1.84 million new placements through the Job Active program since its inception in 2015. But the Morrison government will not rest on its laurels, Senators, and indeed we look at the industrial relations bill before this place now that improves enterprise agreements, delivering on average 40 per cent more into the pockets of hard-working Australians, offers the opportunity to grow jobs, increases freedom and flexibility within the labour market and offers, offers new protections for employees in this place. Why then? Why don't Australians already enjoy those benefits? It is because the Labor Party chooses to obstruct more money in the pockets of hard-working Australians. On the flexibility and freedoms afforded to those in the gig economy, the Labor Party are most focused on racing to the bottom as usual and talking about a minimum wage. The Victorian Labor government's inquiry into the gig economy found, on average, the mean wage of a gig economy worker at $32.16, which represents a 62 per cent increase on the Australian minimum wage. Ladies and gentlemen, senators, the Labor Party would rather that Australians not enjoy 62 per cent extra earning capacity because of their ideological attachment to standing between Australians and employers. 30 per cent of part-time workers in, retail, in the retail industry and 40 per cent of part-time workers in the accommodation and food services sectors can work extra hours under the modifications and reforms contemplated by the IR, IR Omnibus Bill. Instead, we see the Labor Party saying no. We've offered a clear and consistent pathway to convert casual employment to full-time employment for the first time. But by blocking this legislation, Labor would rather have casual workers remain casual, even if they'd prefer permanency. In opposing these changes, Labor has decided that it is against casual employees and it would rather keep those casual, uh, uh, keep those casual employees as collateral damage in their ongoing class warfare in this country. So much for Labor being on your side. If you're not a casual who wants permanent work, they will leave you aside. In fact, when we talk about cutting workers' pay and conditions in this place, at the moment the Labor Party are proposing to cut workers' pay and conditions. Because we've seen from the thought bubble from the Leader of the Opposition last week a $20 billion a year business tax and a cut for casuals equal to, on average, $153 a week. That's right. They would take $153 a week out of your pocket and impose a $20 billion a year tax on Australian business. So, you know, we've seen this from the ACTU. Which side of this chamber, which side of this chamber proposes to cut taxes, it has to cut workers' pay? It is those opposite. When Labor vote against this bill, they are also voting against increased criminal penalties for wage theft. Now, those who have experienced wage theft or underpayment will be better protected under the reforms proposed by this government. You might have thought that it would be uncontroversial, but those opposite are too busy playing politics with this bill to the detriment of hard-working Australians. The tougher civil and new criminal penalties to stamp out wage theft are simply casualties of Labor's class war, collateral damage like the casual workers that they would sooner deny uh, the opportunity of permanent employment. Indeed, a quicker way to recover underpayments where they occur is also included in this bill. Instead, Labor have said, by blocking this bill, that they don't want it easier to recover wages for those exploited workers in Australia. So much for the Labor Party being on your side. In this bill, uh, enterprise agreements are, 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 are said to be more easily implemented, with tighter approval timeframes, and will deliver 40 per cent, on average, higher wages into the pockets of Australians compared to award, and yet the Labor Party stand in their way. When we consider 2020, we should be doing everything in our power to reduce the red tape, 
to reduce the restrictions, to reduce the amount of time between employees lawfully reaching an agreement with an employer and the increasing amounts of money in their pay packets. Instead, because of the prevarication of the Labor Party, we see nothing. Instead, what we have seen is a proposal for portable entitlements. And it should be no surprise to us that Labor has trotted this out. It's an attractive idea on first glance. But when we stop and we take stock of how that would actually be implemented, we see examples already written large in the Australian economy of the Labor Party doing dodgy deals, as Senator Sheldon referred to, to join forces, take money from hard-working Australians and instead put them away in secretive slush funds that donate money from the unions to the ALP. The idea that Australians be empowered to control the fruits of their own labour, take more of the hard-earned money that they earn for themselves and their families is what motivates us. And yet those opposite, instead, under the union control that they, they seem unable to step from, uh, instead happily take in the case of IncoLink in Victoria, uh, money from working Australians and instead donate $8.5 million back to the CFMEU and take $10 million off Australian workers and give it away in wages in a jobs for the boys scandal that, frankly, Australians should be appalled about. You tell me, who cares about the well-being of working Australians and their pay and conditions? It seems to be the government, the Morrison government, with a track record of being focused on job opportunities and job creation, and instead the Morrison government finds itself unable to deliver for those hard-working Australians because of those opposite. Now you might think that you know this this uh, this uh, uh, this loss of of workers' entitlements would be well known, but far less well known is the fact that even having taken money from those uh, hard-working Australians and putting it into a slush fund under the guise of them being entitlements, portable entitlements, instead the payment of those entitlements, far from being governed by law, is in fact at, and I quote, the absolute discretion of the trustee. And when determining the amount uh, and period of, of the entitlement that the worker shall receive, the decision of the trustee is, and I quote, final and the worker has no right of appeal. The silence is deafening from the Labor Party when it comes to defending themselves on this matter. In fact, we shouldn't expect anything less from the CFMEU. Funded by money stolen from workers in this way, building unions break the law more than anyone. Responsible in 90 per cent of federal court cases for coercion, right of entry and freedom of association breaches, they're 20 times more likely than all other unions combined to break the law. Indeed, the CFMEU secretary at the time said, if you played by the law, you'll never win. So it is no wonder that the Labor Party, beholden to these union thugs, has chosen to stand in the way of a proposal to, to offer Australians new opportunities to convert casual employment to full-time employment, to offer flexibility to accommodate uh, family life, caring responsibilities, sport, education and everything else that makes up modern life. And instead, they obstinately stick to their, uh, their union domination uh, in obstructing the government from Im implementing these important reforms. I thank you. You send the small. Send the well, going to toss a coin here. No, send the Patrick. Sorry, sorry, send the Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise tonight to, this afternoon to make a, a quick contribution, and I just want to draw Senators' attentions to two graphs that I think uh, are important. Uh, the first of those is uh, the ASX 200. It's currently sitting at about uh, 6,885 points uh, at, at close today, but it's actually very close to where it was uh, in February last year, just prior to COVID, when it was in the low 7,000s. So that's one graph where we see companies doing well, we see wealth, uh, we see prosperity in a particular camp. Then I'm going to look at another graph, which is the Australian Bureau of Statistics Wage Price Index. And that uh, shows a, a graph that goes in the opposite direction, that uh, sees uh, wa you know, wage growth 
uh, has collapsed over the last decade. And, you know, that is concerning because whilst I, I uh, absolutely respect the idea that those who go into business and take a risk, uh, those that invest, uh, should, get the right, uh, should get a rightful return, um, it's got to be proportioned. It's, it's got to be reasonable. Wealth and prosperity needs to be shared by all of those involved in economic activity. And so these two graphs uh, cause me great trouble. You know, I see, uh, uh, I see workers paying tax. Um, I see companies not paying tax. And these are sorts of differences that I think we need to look at very, very closely. Uh, lot of, lots and lots of focus, uh, traditional battlegrounds for Labor and Liberal in relation to IR. Um, I, I get that there is absolutely need to protect uh, workers' salaries and to look for an increase. Uh, but uh, as I look at this next uh, IR bill, I'll be looking at it through the lens of prosperity Senator for all. Patrick, your time is expired. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. And well, well, well. After seven years of government, uh, after more than seven years of being in power, um, they are absolutely out of ideas to take this country forward. And all we've seen in this debate from those oppos opposite are some bizarre conspiracy theories. I don't think there's any other way you could describe it as that. Um, some old attacks from Senator Abetz, but he does like the old attack. Um, we know that he's always good for that, and we've seen him trot him out uh, over the last couple of years. But what we actually haven't seen from this government is no plan to actually take the country forward, no plan to help workers and their families get ahead. No plan to offer those workers and their families a better future, something to look forward to. And we know that they offered none of that before the pandemic. And since the pandemic hit, as Australians are actually looking for that vision, they actually want to see a better future, we see nothing from this government but attacks on workers and their conditions. And it is absolutely a challenge for working people at the moment. Uh, we know that they do want to be optimistic about what the future looks like, but the government are incapable of actually having a vision. They didn't have one before the pandemic, and they don't have one now as a way to take the country forward. So stagnant have the conditions been for working Australians since this government was elected that they've actually given up trying to look for that better deal, uh, look for that optimism to give them that solution. No, the only thing they come up with is that tired old attack on workers and their conditions, uh, and they trot it out. Uh, trying to appeal to uh, crossbenchers to back them in that mission. And the concerning thing for Australians is that the government have been in power for so long that they continue to fall back on this trick, that this is the only thing they've got. Um, we see it with working conditions. We see it with the role that they're trying to play at the moment, undermining superannuation and deny working Australians dignity in retirement. But let's actually consider what Australians are confronting at the moment. And according to the OECD, and uh, we know those opposite actually have a lot of faith in the OECD at the moment. Um, I'm sure that they're uh, all keeping a close eye on what is going on there. But according to the OECD, since the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government was elected in 2013, real wages in Australia have declined by 0.7 per cent. This is actually their record. Real wages in Australia have declined by 0.7 per cent. And for wage growth in 2019, Australia was third last out of 35 OECD countries. So this is the record of the government uh, that been in power since 2013 that they have delivered for Australian workers. And this is before the pandemic has hit. So this was after six years in government, this is what the conditions that they left for working people in Australia. Um, Real wage growth had declined by 0.7, and in 2019 we were third last out of 35 OECD countries. And we know the underutilisation rate is at 15 per cent, um, well above pre pandemic levels, and 2.1 million Australians who are unemployed or looking for more work. Uh, in Queensland, there is 16 per cent underutilisation, uh, 240,000 people are underemployed and 209,000 people are unemployed. So when you look around the country, when you look at what's happening in Queensland, there is such a raw deal for workers. Uh, and we know that the Liberals and Nationals have dropped uh, their um, pursuit of the better off overall test. 
but they only did that because it wouldn't pass the parliament. And you can see in even what the Attorney General, the minister responsible, has said since when he announced that he wouldn't pursue it, is that he called those changes sensible and proportionate. So this is the minister that is pursuing these changes, or was pursuing these changes, still saying that these changes are sensible and proportionate. So what the Australian working people need to know and what their families need to know is that this government will not stop their pursuit of working people and their conditions. Uh, we know it becomes an ideological obsession for them, uh, but they actually have no plan that is going to offer those workers uh, a better deal. Uh, no plan that is going to give those people something to look forward to, something to look over the horizon, not actually tougher conditions when it comes to working people uh, and the way they are dealt with at work. So it is now, after seven years, uh, too late for this government to actually offer up that vision for the Australian people. It's really important that Labor start to identify that, and we saw elements of that in Queensland last week where federal Labor leader Anthony Albanese started to outline some of his vision for working people in Australia. And that is important. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Macdonald. Uh, thank you. Too many times I hear Labor take a very ordinary position, but today's statement is a new low. This Labor MPI demonstrates the counterproductive, anti-business, anti-family, and in fact anti-employee position. The politics of Labor is class war, and in this war. The casualties are the very people that they are purporting to stand for. The worker who desires the flexibility to earn as much as possible while balancing the commitments to family, to school hours, to events. They should not be locked into some draconian system that forces them and their employer into an unfavourable work plan, dreamed up by a union hack convinced a class war is not only imminent but required. The world is changing and the unions are struggling to keep up. A couple of months ago, I heard evidence at an inquiry uh, where a union told me that they did, not, uh, they did not believe that employees would want to give up uh, work, they did not want to work from home and in fact had not asked them that. And yet we know that since the pandemic, the world has changed very rapidly indeed. This position demonstrates the fantasy world that Labor lives in, where jobs are magically created, their lack of understanding of what it means to mortgage your home, to work all hours, to build a business, carefully budgeting to add another staff member, to deal with the paperwork, the changing awards, the complexity of payments. All they want to talk about is stolen wages. And I can tell you, as one of the people who has employed the 60 per cent of jobs in Australia as a small business operator, that this is not a responsibility that is taken lightly. The relationship that you have with your staff is so important. This is a position that Labor has taken that can only be reached by people who have never employed someone else, who have never sweated over paying creditors and wages and hopefully leaving something in the tin for your family. And it is a position based on a lie. My experience was quite the reverse. When I came into that business, I offered casual workers permanent roles. And while some were pleased to take that on, there were others who absolutely did not. They enjoyed the uh, additional 25% um, for a payment in lieu of uh, holiday pay and sick leave. They like the flexibility of being able to manage their family life. They like to be able to start at hours that suited them and me. And this belief that employers are just out to exploit workers and stamp on the throat of the little guy is rooted in the dark ages. It bears no relevance to today. They don't understand that there is already a condition in place that allows casuals to be offered permanency and, in fact, that converts casuals to permanency. But many casuals do not want that. They want the flexibility of home life and work. If we mandate that casuals must become permanent or if we mandate that employers must alter the working hours of casual people every week in order to comply with that requirement, 
How is that good for employees? How is that good for families? It is just, again, a lack of understanding of what it is like in the world of small business. We should be protecting those people who want more flexible working arrangements and who want to be able to negotiate with their employer wages and conditions that are mutually beneficial. The Coalition's industrial relations reforms achieve balance. It makes it easier for workers and employers to get the job done with minimal fuss, less red tape and more flexibility. And again, I cannot uh, express enough the role of the small business person in Australia who is employing anywhere from one to a hundred additional people who create jobs not from some magical fairy dust, as Labor would have you believe. They, they create these jobs out of blood and sweat and sacrifice from their families. So I want to welcome Labor and the unions to join the 21st century to listen to what workers actually want, instead of simply channelling Karl Marx to dictate old-fashioned employment practices. Senator McDonald. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In serving the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that Senator Pratt is fixated on a problem, not the solution. Yesterday, the government took the first step in recognising One Nation's legitimate concerns for employees and employers. It booted out the boot. Australians need and deserve genuine improvement to our broken industrial relations system. Firstly, casual workers are being abused and exploited. Secondly, the needs of small business have been ignored by everyone except One Nation. The new bill's definition of casual is complex. It suggests that the employer's intention expressed at the time of commencement of employment is the only factor. It's not. The definition also refers to no firm advance commitment. Yet many casuals have a firm advance commitment and many have a regular pattern of hours because it suits both the worker and the business. My second concern is with the proposed right to conversion. It burdens many small businesses and puts the casual loading at risk for workers who enjoy the benefit of a casual loading. The answer is to reduce red tape and complexity for small business and likewise to widen the window of opportunity for workers to apply for conversion. My third and overriding concern is offsetting claims, section 545A. I do not support double dipping on entitlements, yet I will fight to protect workers' legal and moral entitlements, just as I have done relentlessly in the Hunter Valley for 20 months. Recently, the CFMEU Mining Division agreed that their union has ignored casuals for many years, and its national legal director, Mr Bukarika, had the courage and integrity to acknowledge that the Hunter Valley Division has caused and enabled exploitation of casual workers. Labor's Joel Fitzgibbon also ignored abused casuals in the Hunter and hidden their core problems. One Nation stands for the ignored workers that Labor ignores. We're ready to work together with the government to improve this bill for employers and for employees and with all parties. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. I am pleased to speak on today's matter of public importance because it represents one of the most critical issues currently before this parliament an issue of the utmost importance to many millions of Australian wage earners and indeed for the broader Australian economy. Because it is, un it is clear that no matter the circumstances in the economy, the Morrison Liberal government is hell-bent on making it easier to cut workers' pay and conditions. This will, of course, come as no surprise to hard-working, wage-earning Australians. But it certainly does seem a strange way to try and rebuild our economy and improve the lives of working Australians. Strange because pretty much every economic commentator, including the Reserve Bank, have said that lifting stagnant wage growth poses one of the most significant challenges to Australia's short, medium and long-term economic success. Strange because wages, already flatlining, already struggling for many years under this government, have really taken a tumble in the past year. In fact, just yesterday, the latest weekly payroll figures from the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, showed that since the 14th of March last year, wages for men in my state of Tasmania have fallen 5.6 per cent, fallen by more than 5 per cent, a real cut to the take-home pay of tens of thousands of working people and their families. And Mr Morrison 
and his Liberal government want to see those pay packets cut further. It's ideological, not to mention economic lunacy, and it's been, no it's been noticed in the community. Just today, in the Hobart Mercury, eminent Tasmanian barrister Fabiano Cangelosi wrote, after analysing the Morrison government's industrial relations omnibus bill, said, and I quote, the bill seeks to replicate the Howard government's work choices legislation by unbalancing the beneficial value of the economy against working Australians. The omnibus bill amounts to an attempt at capitalising on COVID-19 disruption to wreak lasting change on the industrial relations landscape. If passed into law, the overall effect will be a workforce reduced to the level of mere exploitable resource for big business. The omnibus bill repudiates the core cons cons constitutional role of the federal government to make law for the com common good." End quote. Apt descriptions of the government's bill and their intent indeed. In fact, just yesterday the Morrison government again confirmed it still wants to cut workers' take-home pay. The Attorney General and the Prime Minister were quite clear. They are only prepared to remove from their bill their plan to scrap the better off overall test because they do not have the votes in this place to secure passage. They are not prepared to drop that component because they have suddenly realised that it is unfair. They are not prepared to drop it because they have accepted that enabling the further erosion of the pay of hard-working Australians is not in the national economic interest. No, they just can't get it through the Senate. In fact, in his statement yesterday, the Attorney General stated he still believed the changes to the boot is, and I quote, sensible and proportionate. Sensible and proportionate. Not quite the description I would use for a change that would remove the safety net for workers and give employers significantly more power to cut pay and reduce entitlements. But we know that they are merely retreating on this occasion for the sake of political expediency, because they know that the remaining components of their omnibus bill will continue to work towards their aim of making it easier to cut workers' take-home pay. And we know that, given the opportunity, they will rapidly bring back changes proposed to boot. Labor has always set a very simple test when it comes to any changes to industrial relations. We would support the legislation if it delivered secure jobs with decent pay. The government's legislation still fails that test. Labor has always made it clear that while the boot change was the most egregious attack on jo job security and workers' pay in the, in the government's bill, it certainly was not the only one. The new laws will continue to make it easier for businesses to employ people as casuals, even when they work like permanent workers. This will only result in, in more insecure work, and insecure work over time always means lower pay and fewer conditions. What is crystal clear is that the Morrison government is not on the side of working Senator families, Brown, and they never your deliver. Time has expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, the Greens could not agree more with this motion, but it's clear that not only does the government want to allow employers to cut wages, it, that is the government, is actually leading the charge to suppress wages in this country. One of the biggest levers the government has to change wages across our society and across our economy is its setting of public sector wages, and they are using that lever ruthlessly to depress wages as quickly as they can. Public sector wage caps have helped ensure that wage growth for private sector workers has been flat for years. There has been no pressure on private employers to lift wages. And the government's official policy is, and I'll quote from government documents, that Commonwealth public sector wage rises can no longer exceed wage rises in the private sector. This policy locks in low wages and low wage growth for all workers in the country, public and private sector workers. By increasing wages to public sector employees, the private sector would have to follow and most workers would end up better off. But that's not what this government has chosen to do. 
We know that big businesses are pocketing more and more of their profits, and their servants in the Liberal Party want to keep it that way. And one of the ways they are doing that is by gutting protections in the already weak Fair Work Act. Now, make no mistake, there is a growing gap between the rich and the poor in this country, and the Liberals are working to widen that gap at every opportunity. Colleagues, the combined wealth of Australia's billionaires rose by more than 50 per cent in the last 12 months in the middle of a global pandemic, turbocharging the gap between the super wealthy and the not so well off in Australia, and that gap is still growing. Because while the billionaires get ever more obscenely rich, wage growth is flatlining and millions of Australians remain unemployed or underemployed. The Liberals want to keep wages low and they want to make sure house prices keep soaring. And that's all well and good if you're a wealthy landowner or the CEO of a major corporation or a billionaire, but if you're a renter and a worker, you're left to fight for the scraps. And if you're currently out of work or underemployed, you've been completely left high and dry by this <coughs> government. We need to make sure that income supports rise in this country, and we need to make sure that billionaires and the big corporations, particularly the big polluting fossil fuel corporations, pay their fair share of tax so we can fund quality public services Thank you, in Australia. Senator, Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, this week the Morrison government has confirmed two things. One, they can't get their nasty plan to get rid of the better off overall test through this parliament. And two, they are still determined to cut your pay. In the words of Christine, a cleaner and united workers' union member, there will always be bad bosses. We do not need to make it easier for them to cut wages and change the limited working conditions we currently have. Christine, she is one of my heroes this week because she had the courage to speak out publicly about the government's plan to cut workers' pay. She, along with thousands of Australian workers, have sent a strong message to all of us in this place. And that message is to completely reject the government's nasty industrial relations bill. And along with Christine, I also want to recognise the courage of Karen today. Karen is the registered nurse and ANMF member who came to testify at public hearings on the government's plan. Despite turning up to the hearings on time, prepared and ready, Karen was denied the opportunity to speak, denied the opportunity to tell her story. So I will tell her story here. This is what she wants to tell Scott Morrison and everyone in this place. We are the backbone and the forefront of our healthcare system. We are the ones who know our patients. We are the ones who keep our patients comfortable and safe. We are the ones that reassure our patients and their families. We are the ones that care for them at night, all night, when most other people are tucked up in bed. We are the ones who work weekends doing what we always do, missing out on kids' sports and family functions. We are the ones who cheerily spend Christmas Day with our patients while missing out on our own. And she says, to allow the possibility of removing the protection of EBA standards is a slap in the face of myself and all the other nurses in the country who, without question, sacrificed so much for our community. So Australians should not be fooled. The government's backflip on the Better Off Overall test this week will not protect Australians from being worse off under this bill. Jules is a hospo worker and a member of the Hospo Voice Union, and she sees right through the government's spin. Jules says the government has worded and spun the bill in a way that sounds like it's friendly to workers. After all, increasing flexibility and ending the confusion of casualisation sounds pretty good, right? Wrong, Jules says. When you get into the nuts and bolts, workers end up getting less. She is right. 
There are wholesale changes in the government's bill that will mean more low-wage and non-union agreements, exactly when Australians need a pay rise to keep their heads above water. And there are wholesale changes in the government's bill that will make more workers casual, exactly when Australians are crying out for more job security. And there are wholesale changes in this bill, in this nasty plan, to make part-time work casual, exactly hurting our essential workers who need regular, secure hours to make ends meet and to care for their own families. The experts have spoken on this bill. And I'm talking about the workers like Christine, like Karen, like Jules, who have spoken out about this government's nasty plan. They already work hard for wages that are as, at best modest. They are the people we've called on again and again in this pandemic to keep us safe and to keep our community moving. Cleaners, nurses, hospo workers, these are the people who fought for us during the pandemic. They should not have to fight a pay cut that is being inflicted by their own government. But today I stand with them and I congratulate them for having the courage to stand up and do just that. Thank you, Senator Walsh. The time for discussion has expired. I